One, two, there we go. All right, there we go. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good. the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song you are good good are welcome to join us if you want. There's an insert inside of your program as the, as the words for you. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me go. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let never gonna let me down
me, guys. Why don't you stand with us? God, I thank you for a new day. Thank you for the middle of the day. Um, I thank you for rest this morning um, and time for us to come together to worship you, to bring our stuff to you. Um, God, I pray that we have not left anything outside these walls and that we bring it here tonight and we give it to you. Uh, You are good. You are faithful. You're with us through everything, all of it, good, bad, ugly. You're here and you're with us. And I thank you for that, God. I pray that these songs would be prayers for us. If we're in grief, they'd be prayers for us. If we're in happy, they'd be prayers for us. That these are words for us to sing to each other, to ourselves, and to you. And I pray that your heart would be moved this morning, this evening, God. Um, and would you pour yourself upon us? In Jesus' name, amen. I told myself, don't say morning. Don't say morning. Like I dreamed about it last night. You're going to say morning. You're gonna, I, no, I'm not going to say it. I did it. All right, sing these words with this mighty fortress. It's in your, uh, in your little program. Oh, mighty fortress is our God. Oh, bulwark never failing. Oh, mighty fortress is our God. Oh, bulwark never failing. He won't abandon, he won't deceive, he won't desert us, he won't ever leave, he'll never reject us, he won't ever run, he'll never reject us, the faithful
so good.
real quick before Kenny comes up, the second verse, um, if you guys would look at that, it says, haunted by the past no more. My innocence has been restored. Forgiveness flows from your veins. Your kindness shown in all your ways. I don't know what you brought in tonight. I know what I brought in. And uh, I just want us to sing that verse one more time. And I want you guys to let those words fall in your heart as you sing them. And celebrate as you sing them. And then we'll sing the chorus one more time together. Now can you hear me? Well, I don't want to talk now. So take that. So it is a lot different. Uh, different time of day. Uh, we're in the sanctuary, not over in the gym. Uh, there's no donuts. Um, but you know it's not good. It just from the first, as the band began to sing that, even before the service started, and they were beginning to sing about God's goodness, and then those last two songs, that's what's not different, right? I mean, God is so good, so worthy of our worship. It doesn't matter what time of the day it is. Uh, it's good to be here. It's good to be worshiping with his people. And uh, we're excited to be here with you tonight. And glad that you uh, chose to join us. Um, in addition to the opportunity just to worship, as we always do tonight, is a communion service. And so that's a kind of a special uh, opportunity as well to experience something a little more unique tonight. So glad that you're here. Um, let's, let's pray as we open up tonight. Heavenly Father, we have, have sung of your goodness tonight, and, and it is so true. You are worthy in every way. You are the refuge that we sang about tonight, so that I, I pray that whatever we are facing, as each person in this room might be facing something tonight, where they need you to be their refuge, their place where they hide and they find you and they find strength and they find whatever it is they need. I pray that tonight, as we're here together, gathered in your presence, I pray that you would minister very personally to each of us. We've come here tonight because we need you more than anything else. And we long to be in your presence, not only to, to worship you and declare how worthy you are, but because in you we find all that we need. So I pray tonight as we experience your presence that each person would experience whatever it is they need from you tonight. You are worthy. Your love is astounding. As H.L. read that verse again about love flowing from your veins as we consider tonight as we gather around the table of your broken body and spilled blood, we just begin by acknowledging what a what a costly and extravagant salvation you have provided for us, and we are grateful tonight for your love. It's that love, it's that sacrifice on the cross that enables us to come tonight without any kind of fear or condemnation or guilt, but to come freely and just enjoy being in your presence and bragging and declaring how good you are. So we praise you tonight. We pray that all that we do, the prayers and the listening to your word and, 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 uh, and, and Zach preaching and us responding to your word and celebrating communion, that all that we do tonight, we 
our prayer would be that it would honor you, that it would glorify you, and that it would hold you in high esteem because you are worthy. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, glad that you're here. Um, if you are a guest or a visitor, uh, really neat that you're here in, in kind of an odd, uh, different time in a different place, but really glad that you visited with us. We normally meet, probably as you know, if you came with somebody, we meet on Sunday mornings at 1030, uh, but we're glad that you're here tonight. If you would, uh, if you are a guest or a visitor, if you'd take just a few minutes to fill out the information slip that's in your worship guide, uh, and really encourage everybody to fill these out every week. Um, if you're not, if you're more a regular attender, there are opportunities, a place on the back where you can fill out prayer requests. Uh, let us know things that are happening in your life that you'd like some prayer support for. Uh, and then these can be turned in uh, with the offering um, in just a few minutes. Um, this is a, a, a sad to say, but the summer is coming to a close, as most of you know, and things are about to kind of ramp up for everybody whose life kind of dictates or is a little bit controlled by the school year. Um, that's all about to ramp up. And so the, the schedule here at the church really gets busy also in the month of August and September. And so check your worship guide out. There's lots that you can pay attention to and be aware of. Uh, I'm just going to highlight a couple things. Um, on August the 26th, we are having our back-to-school tailgate event. And so in the worship services, there, there are a few special things that we do that day. We have our blessings, the backpacks, and so we invite kids to bring their backpacks uh, with them, and with, it gives us an opportunity, a, a kind of a symbolic uh, opportunity to kind of pray for our students as they all head back to school. Um, we also um, pray for teachers and administrators, homeschool parents, any, anybody involved in education. We have a special time to kind of pray a blessing over them as they start the school year. And then right after the morning services, uh, we then have a big kind of a tailgate event out on the front lawn uh, with food trucks and giveaways. And it's just kind of a, a really neat day to kind of be together as the whole church kind of celebrating and preparing for uh, a new school year. So mark your calendars for the 26th. It's a great event to invite people to. So if you have neighbors, friends, uh, schoolmates, that kind of thing, kids, your kids' friends are going back to school, it's a great time to invite them to something where they'll get to experience the worship of the church, but then they'll also get to experience just the, the friendship and the hospitality and the fun uh, after the service. So mark your calendars for that. Uh, and then also remember, next week we are back on Sunday morning, uh, Vine, at 1030 uh, in the gym. Um, okay, all right, well, at this time, why don't we greet one another, say hello to some people around you. We'll continue. All right, would well, you make your way back to your seats? Uh, as the ushers prepare to take the offering, let's pray. Once again, Lord, you are good and faithful to us, and we are grateful. Uh, your faithfulness and generosity is what puts our hearts at ease so that we are not people who have to worry. We're not people who have to fear. We're not people who have to be insecure about being taken care of because you're a good heavenly father who does take care of us in every way. And so, Lord, as an expression of our trust and as an expression of worship, uh, we give back to you. We, we sacrifice, we invest in the things that matter most to you. And so tonight, we ask that you would accept our offering as an act of worship. And we pray that you would help us as a community uh, to then use the resources that we put together to um, spread your name, spread your love, uh, make your, um, your love real and tangible to our community and to our world. We pray that you would help us to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As the ushers are coming forward, I'm going to read our scripture tonight. If you have your Bibles or phones or tablets and you want to turn to the book of Titus, which is a New Testament book. It's one of... Uh, the letters of Paul, and I'm actually going to read the whole chapter, uh, the whole first chapter um, as we begin tonight. So beginning in Titus chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, and hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. 
to Titus, my true child in common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced, since they are upsetting whole families by the teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons, this testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. This is God's word, and it is trustworthy. How about that? They kept turning it up probably. Now it's too loud. Let's pray before we begin. Gracious God, uh, we thank you for this, uh, this, this night, for time to worship and to, to open your word. And Lord, we pray that it would be a lamp to our feet and a light into our path, uh, that we might follow you closely, that we might follow you dearly. And by following you, we would reflect something of your goodness and glory to everyone we meet. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. When Jules and I first had kids, um, I, I, I was nervous about having children, but I didn't even know what I was nervous about. And it wasn't until we had Caleb that I began to understand what I was nervous about. It was uh, the fact that I was nervous about not even knowing what I didn't know. Like, I didn't know that kids have cries for each thing that they have a need for. I didn't realize that when I first had Caleb. Like, he had a cry if he had a dirty diaper. And it was an entirely different cry from cries that if he was hungry. And it was a different cry if he was tired or overly tired. I didn't know all those things. And it took us weeks and months to kind of crack the translation code because they don't give you like an English to infant crying uh, dictionary when you're a parent. And, and then we had... Um, then we had uh, 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 Hanny, and, and you do the thing when you have your second child, you think, I got it, got it down, know what I'm doing now, got it all together. But here's the thing, each child is different. Did you know that? Total shocker to me. I thought infant is an infant is an infant. And Hanny had very different cries from Caleb because she had different needs and different strengths and different personality. And guess what? She was a whole different person altogether. It was like, Hello, idiot. I mean, come on. That's, that's how I 
kind of got to that point. And as we've been at parents now for almost eight years, we've learned that there's nothing the same about our two children. And you can't parent them the same. You, you parent them with love, and you parent them with affection, and you parent them with grace, but you can't parent them exactly the same because they're not the same. They require different things. You know, at the beginning of the Christian movement, God called a man named Paul to plant congregations all around uh, southeastern Europe and, and western Asia. And he planted churches in places uh, like Corinth and, and Philippi and Ephesus. And if we take the word of Jesus seriously in John chapter 3, that when we step into a life of faith, it's like being born again. It's like becoming an infant all over again. If we take that seriously, then in a very real sense, Paul was like the spiritual daddy to all these different congregations and, and different churches. They were infants in the faith when he left them. He had presented them with this, this new way of life, a life patterned after the good news of Jesus Christ. And this caused a radical change in those individuals and in their lives and their communities. And just like a father who's developing a child, Paul looked at these infant churches by, by teaching them and, and guiding them and, and putting leaders in place who would also lead and guide just as he had done. Paul would go to these towns and then he would, he would leave an area with, with a, a leader in place to do his, the work that he had begun and then he would write letters back to those churches just to check on them, each according to their different needs and their different strengths. In Ephesus, for example, Paul left a, a young pastor named Timothy to continue the work that he had begun, and he wrote letters to, to the Ephesians, that's one of our books of the Bible, and to Timothy, that's what we have in First and Second Timothy. Now, in, in one such place, uh, Paul took a, a young man named Titus to an island called Crete. And if you have your, your worship guide, and you've got the, the little handout that has the uh, the lyrics in it. We also have some sermon notes on the back, and I realized as I was preparing this message that I really rely on the screen a lot. And so I had to put some stuff down in there. But there's a map, and you can kind of see where Crete is in relationship to um, the, 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 the Greek peninsula. It's just kind of like south, southeast of the Greek peninsula. And Titus had gone with Paul to plant churches around this island. Now, Titus is an interesting person because out, outside of this letter um, that Paul has written to Titus, which is the title of this series, we don't know a whole lot about this, this, this guy. He's not mentioned anywhere in the book of Acts, which is the, the history of the early church. He's mentioned briefly in a number of Paul's other letters, like 2 Corinthians and Galatians and 2 Timothy. And from those places, we can piece together a little bit about who Titus was. Titus was, first of all, a non-Jewish follower of Jesus Christ. We call him a Gentile. More than likely, he was of Greek descent. Paul trusted Titus. He trusted him to go back to some of the other churches that he had founded with, with instruction and with letters and, and to collect uh, funds for the poor Christians that were being persecuted in Jerusalem. And there's one line in these letters where Paul talks about Titus specifically and he says, Titus is a great encourager to me. He's a great encourager to me. And so Paul and Titus travel to this island called Crete. Now Crete today is a, a kind of a tourist island. I actually googled Crete and you know Google imaged it and it's beautiful. I was like man this might be on my bucket list now. All the beautiful the, the beautiful water surrounding the island. Um, has anyone been to Crete? Ever? A few people. Mike Loudon has been to Crete of all the places. Okay there you go. We're gonna have to talk after this. I've never been there but it looks really cool. Now in, in the time of, of Titus and Paul though it had a reputation it had a very bad reputation. Paul actually writes to Titus saying this. He says, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, has said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. So Paul quotes this Cretan prophet 
this Cretan priest, this Cretan poet, and he says, this guy has said they're always liars, they're always evil beasts, they're always lazy gluttons. Now you expect Paul, being a good church guy, wanting to say, you know what, and they're not that bad. But he doesn't. He says in very clear tones, this testimony is true. What that prophet has said is true. Now, the prophet that Paul is talking about is a guy named Epimenides. We actually know this. We can actually trace this back historically. And Epimenides was from Crete, and he was a religious leader in the the Greek pagan religion. And he wrote this about the Cretans because the Cretans actually believed that the birthplace and the tomb of Zeus were on their island. Now, I don't know if you remember, you know, Greek pagan religion, you know, learning that when you were in school, Greek mythology. Zeus is kind of a big deal, okay? He's like the top in the pantheon of gods. And the Cretans said, hey, guess what? The birthplace and the resting place of our god our chief God, it's in our tiny little island. And that made them extremely arrogant and extremely boastful. And it caused them to engage in all sorts of bad behavior. And so Epimenides looked at the Cretans and said, they are liars. They are evil. They are lazy gluttons. That, that term Cretan actually had such negative connotations that up through the 20th century in the United States of America, to call someone a Cretan was a terrible insult. I didn't realize how bad an insult it was until I was watching a movie with my children called Monsters, Inc. Have you ever seen Monsters, Inc., the Pixar movie? There's a point in that movie in which one of the monster characters calls another monster character a Cretan. That's how big a deal it was. It's carried all the way through to a children's movie in the 21st century in the United States of America. That's how weighty this testimony was. This is how bad Crete was in the time of Paul and Titus. It wasn't exactly a place that screamed, yes, come plant a church here on our island. And what made matters even worse and made the island even more of a difficult place for the church to grow and become established was that there was religious competition from teachers who claimed to be at least somewhat associated with Christianity. Paul writes to Titus, he says, there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Now, Paul had to deal with a lot of what he called false teachers in his church planting ministry. There were a lot of teachers who who claimed to have some connection with Christianity that were teaching something counter to what he was teaching about Jesus Christ. They would say things that essentially came down to things like this. They would say, like, Jesus is great, Jesus is awesome, but you know what? In order to believe in Jesus and to really be a follower of a Jesus, you must be a Jew first. You must be a follower of Judaism first, which means you have to adhere to all the dietary restrictions of the Jewish faith. You have to adhere to all the, the holidays of the Jewish faith. Oh, and guys, if you're not circumcised, you got to be circumcised, small thing, Okay. And and that was kind of their M.O. And some of them actually went so far as to say, if you do those externals, then you can do whatever you want to on your own time. You can sin freely because God's grace is so big and God's love is so amazing that you can just be as immoral as you want to, be as drunk as you want to, be as promiscuous as you want to. And it doesn't matter because Jesus saved you. And as long as you look like a Jew, you're all right. This was the kind of teaching that Titus and Paul were dealing with in Crete. And can you imagine if I got up here and started preaching a sermon like that? Let's say, hey, Jesus is so awesome. His love is so amazing. He is so good to us that we could just go do whatever we want to. So let's all go outside and have a big old kegger and be as promiscuous as we want to be. And, And if you preach that sermon in Crete, where the people are already prone to that kind of behavior, You can imagine they're like, yes, sign me up. I'm all for it. And that's what these teachers, the kind of thing these teachers were teaching, causing all sorts of problems. So this island wasn't exactly what we would call a place that was ripe for the gospel. It wasn't exactly a place that was a promising ground for the, the good news to be planted. 
And yet, D.A. Carson and Douglas Moo, these two commentators, when they're writing about Titus, they wrote this, this statement that really just jumped out at me. They wrote, the gospel is for the most unpromising people. That's what the gospel's for. It's not for the people who think they're righteous or act so holy. It's not for the people that think they have it all figured out. It's for the unpromising, the most unpromising of people. You know, I think one of our chief struggles in North American Christianity is we don't think like that. In fact, when uh, uh, church associations and church denominations decide where they're going to plant congregations, they actually do studies based on the religious, spiritual receptivity of an area. They'll do all sorts of of demographic studies and, and, and insight studies to see how receptive a place will be. Does it have the financial resources to support a congregation? And they'll plant churches in the places that appear most promising where the congregations will actually flourish and grow. And that makes good business sense. But the problem is it doesn't make good gospel sense. In God's economy, the gospel is for the most unpromising people in the places where it doesn't make sense. For example, if you look at China, China is still a communist nation and very hostile to Christianity from a governmental kind of societal standpoint. And yet in 2010, it was estimated that there are 35 million Christians in China, which that would be miraculous in and of itself. But from 2010 until today, the past eight years, the estimated number is over 100 million Christians. And at this rate, by 2030, in 12 years, China will be the most Christian nation in the world, in a place where it is illegal to be a Christian. These are genuine conversions. This isn't just some like, you know, bloated, this is actually probably very kind of an underwhelming number. It's actually maybe even higher than that because people won't acknowledge it and the government tries to tamp it out. Why? Why in a place where it's so illegal and so unpromising, why in a place like China is the gospel flourishing and growing and and taking root? Well, in, in Crete, the answer was simple. Someone had to go, who was passionate about Jesus, who was passionate about bringing the message of Jesus to unpromising people, and who was willing to train others to come along the journey with them. Passion for Jesus, passion for the people, and passion to lead. Paul says to Titus, this is why I left you in Crete. This is the reason I left you in Crete, so that you might put put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Paul and Titus had come to Crete on a mission. They had come to this unpromising territory to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to this, this tiny little island. And Paul had left Titus there to make sure The people there had leaders from amongst their own who were trained in the gospel so they could train other people in the gospel and live different lives. In the book of Titus, these people are called elders or overseers. And they were called to be counter-cultural, to look very different from the immoral Cretans or the false teachers that surrounded them. And these were the qualifications that Paul wrote Uh, to Titus about for these elders. He says, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and and also rebuke those who contradict it. See, Titus was to find people who had a good moral reputation and to find people who could be trained to hold on to the gospel and be countercultural to the Cretan environment. Now, if you look at the standards of these leaders, they seem like no-brainers. You don't want your church leaders to be super violent. It's probably not a good thing. You don't want your church leaders to be like drunks. You don't want your church leaders to be greedy or arrogant. That seems like a no-brainer, but you have to understand in the Cretan culture, that was the status quo. 
That was how they lived their lives. And so for Paul to tell Titus, call out people with this kind of countercultural set of beliefs and set of standards, that was a very, very big deal. These leaders needed to be different than their unpromising environment. You know, we live in an increasingly unpromising cultural context. The, kind of the latest statistics show that millennials, 30% of millennials claim no religious affiliation. It's not just that they don't go to church, it's that they claim no religious affiliation. It's not that they're not spiritual, but they want to develop their own spirituality that kind of helps them feel good about life, but they can kind of make their own rules and do what they want to do. And, and, and the reason that people have, have moved further and further away from Christianity in the church, it's not because the good news is, is not still the good news. It's not because God isn't good. It's because we as the church and we as Christians, we have failed to show people that we are passionate about Jesus and that we're passionate about the unpromising and that we're passionate about being a little different in our environment. We haven't done a good job of that. And so how do we change the course of our culture. I think there's really three things, and they're, they're listed in your, your worship guide, how we get there. I think the first thing is we gotta passionately know who Jesus is. And I'm not just talking about a mental, kind of educational ascent to, to facts about Jesus. I'm talking about being in love with Jesus. And I know that using that, that romantic term, it kind of turns people off. I get that. But I'm talking about being so passionately devoted to knowing who Jesus is that we can't not reflect who he is in our lives. Michael Frost, the, the famous Australian pastor, he, he kind of compels his congregation to be Jesus experts. If you don't know what to read in the Bible, read the Gospels. Read Matthew, read Mark, read Luke, read John, and then when you get done, read them again because you're going to miss something. You get to the end of that, read it again. Become Jesus experts to develop a passion for this one that we call Savior and Lord who consistently and constantly reached unpromising people. Develop a passion for knowing Jesus and then develop a passion for the unpromising, the places and the people that, that you think, there's no way, there's no way they're going to accept Jesus. There's no way they'd come to church. There's no way. But developing a passion for those who we consider un unpromising and train to be countercultural leaders in those places and with those people. That means learning to love the places and the people that aren't necessarily Christians, but they still need Jesus, and they need us to be Jesus influencers in their lives. You know, as the school year approaches, maybe it's, maybe it's like your local school, your local elementary school, your local middle school, your local high school. Whether you have kids there or not, trust me, the administrators and the teachers are not going to say no to help. And I'm not talking about going in with a Bible and thumping it at them. I'm talking about going in and saying, how can, we be a, how can I personally be a blessing to you, to your school, to your students? That's one of the reasons that we've been collecting these, these, these school supplies for Philip O'Brien. Because it's our local elementary school. I'm going to drop them off next week and we're going to keep collecting for a little while longer. We're going to drop some more off so that we can kind of just get in there and just say, hey, no agenda, we just want to be a blessing. We just want to be a blessing. And we want to be a blessing because Jesus has blessed us in whatever way we can. We want to reflect that. Maybe it's in your workplace. And maybe, maybe it's as, as extreme as starting like a Bible study or a prayer group, but it might be even more simple than that. It might just be looking at somebody in your workplace that, that just kind of you just feel like God is compelling you to develop a relationship and taking them out to lunch or just going to lunch with them and just developing that relationship and praying for them and praying with them and saying, hey, you know what? I don't want to get weird on you, but I'm praying for you. Because they might think it's weird, and that's okay. It's okay to be a little weird. Um, I was talking to um, Brian Morgan a couple weeks ago, and he's our student minister and he's gotten in the habit of taking some of the students out to different meals, especially throughout the summer. And uh, as they do that, he's kind of trained them to ask the server if there's anything that they can pray for the server as they're blessing the meal. And at first, uh, the kids were like, well, they're going to think I'm weird. 
Yeah, they are, (laughs) because nobody treats them like a human being. Nobody treats them like anything more than just someone who brings the meal to them. And that little, that little act of blessing, that little act of care, it, it can make such a difference in being a Jesus-led influencer in even the most unpromising of environments. And they've gotten into some really cool conversations in those restaurants. You know, we're not all called to be church elders or overseers. We're not all called to be behind a pulpit or to teach a Bible study, but we are all called to be countercultural passionately led followers of Jesus Christ who influence even the most unpromising of environments for him. We are all called to that in whatever circle we find ourselves in. And it, it might get a little strange, and it may take a little training, it might take a little discipline, but it's worth it if we see the fruit begin to form. See, God's calling us to the unpromising, the most unpromising of environments. He's calling us to be influencers for the sake of Jesus Christ. That Jesus who died on the cross for us when we were the most unpromising. The question is, will we answer the call? Let's pray. Gracious God, and we thank you. We're so grateful that You didn't look on us and say, hey, they don't deserve my love. They don't deserve my grace. You didn't look at us and and judge us according to how good we were. Because if you had, we, we would have failed. But Lord, you looked down on us and came to us in grace and in love with forgiveness and mercy. Even when we were unpromising, Even when we were still rejecting you, you were still reaching out to us. Lord, help us not forget that. Help us to not lose sight of that so that as we go into our spheres of influence, even places that, that aren't necessarily Christian places or full of Christian people, in places that appear very unpromising, that, that you would motivate us out of gratitude to you to just be blessings for the sake of Jesus Christ, to be your influencers in those environments. We pray, Lord, that you would wrap us in your spirit and in your love and motivate us to good works. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. The gospel is for the most unpromising of people. It was true for the Cretans, and it's true for us. And that's what makes it amazing news. And like all amazing news, sometimes amazing news is a little bit hard to believe. So how can an infinitely perfect God offer people like us who are unpromising and imperfect such radical grace and forgiveness? That's the question. And the answer is, Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross. You see, our sin was not simply dismissed. It wasn't just overlooked. It was punished in Jesus. So that we might know that forever, the basis of our salvation is not our goodness. It's not our performance. It's not our righteousness. That's not the base of our confidence before God. And we needed to know that, and we needed to be reminded of that often. But instead, the basis is Jesus and his grace and what he's done for us. So salvation is free to us, but it cost him everything. And what Jesus did with those first followers and what he instituted for all of his followers was called the Lord's Supper. And it was a way to remind us of the costly love that rescued us. And when we come like this to the Lord's Supper and we celebrate together, we are assured that if he saved us, he is here with us to offer us a unique experience of his presence and his grace. When we come to the Lord's Supper, we are reminded again of his costly love. And we're also, when we come, it's interesting, out of all the symbols Jesus could have chosen to use. I mean, he told parables about all sorts of things in the created world. 
And yet when he decides what is it that he wants to establish as a habitual, symbolic practice of the earliest Christians, he chose something so simple. Food and drink. Things that we know are just, they're necessary to, to live and to thrive, to be nourished. And I think about the call that, that Zach just extended to us from God's word, this call to engage and to love and to sacrifice and to be on mission with Jesus. The truth is, is we in and of ourselves don't have what it takes to do that. It could be intimidating. It, it, it costs us emotional energy and strength. Well, Jesus invites us even tonight to a table where we will again be nourished uh, by the reminders of his love and the call to depend on him. This is one of those symbolic reminders. So as we come to the table, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful tonight for your word. We're grateful for the call, for the reminder that you came for imperfect people like us, unpromising people like us, who by trusting in you and trusting what you've done for us that we could not do for ourselves, that we went from being unpromising people to people of incredible promise not in and of ourselves, but because we are connected to you. We now have promise and hope and purpose. We thank you for the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross. And somehow in eternity past, that decision was made. And I'm sure when the angels heard about it, they, they almost couldn't believe their ears that somehow the perfect God would become one of us and then would allow himself to be called a sinner. That on the cross he might take our guilt and our shame and be punished and experience your wrath and your judgment so that we might be called the sons and the daughters of God and be forgiven. So we are grateful tonight for that reminder. We're grateful for the invitation to come to your table and be um, not only reminded of that love but to experience it afresh tonight. So I pray as we come that you'd be with us in a special, in a unique way. Nourish us, unite us. And then Lord, as we are nourished and have tasted again of your love and your forgiveness, we pray that this would be enough to send us in to our neighborhoods and our workplaces to spread that love. Thank you for all of this and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. And when you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. This table does not belong to First Presbyterian Church. This table belongs to Jesus. So if you are a follower of Christ and you've trusted him, then you are welcome to the table tonight. So in just a moment, um, Zach and I uh, and the elders are going to set up two stations down here in the front. And once we're kind of set up, then you are welcome to come. You're not going to be dismissed row by row. Uh, so as you feel ready to come, You'll come to the center aisle, make your way forward, receive the elements, and then you'll kind of circle back around to your seats. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, it has been good to share your meal, to be reminded again in a very tangible way of the sacrifice of your broken body and your shed blood, that you took our place so that we might know this radical forgiveness and grace, that we might know and experience your love in a profound way and be changed by it. So we have tasted of your goodness and tasted of your love again tonight. We pray now that it would send us out with nourishment to answer the call that's been given to us by your word. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
stand with us. guys for coming out and worshiping and singing and, and open up God's word uh, with us tonight. And next week we will be back at 1030 in Loudon Hall, just like normal on Sunday morning. But between now and then, I remember the words of that song, that the love of Jesus Christ is marvelous for each and every one of us. And, and as the words on the communion table say, do this in remembrance of me, every action that we take from now until next Sunday, let us do them in remembrance of the grace and love of Jesus Christ that reached down to us, even when we were sinners, so we can reach out to others. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. See you guys next Sunday.